Hello, everyone. Uh, back to continue our discussion of anatomy 2402, looking now at the respiratory system. So up to this point, uh, we've looked at the heart, the circulatory system. Uh, we've looked at lymphatic. We've looked at then the um, immune uh, response, immune components. Um, now we're going to integrate sort of a little bit of all of that together, uh, specifically looking at how the circulatory system now integrates with the respiratory system and what we're going to call then the uh, cardiovascular system, right? So the cardio, the heart, the vascular, the, the vessels, but a key aspect of the systemic circuit is the transportation of oxygen. And oxygen then will be generated by uh, the breathing, the pulmonary ventilation aspect, uh, internal respiration. And we're going to get into a lot of the that, uh, vocabulary, uh, the details, but Let's open this up here. And we begin our discussion with the anatomy of the respiratory system, which is uh, kind of um, a little bit simpler than, than what we saw with the immune system. So the immune system had no anatomy of its own. We're going to see the respiratory system uh, has its own set of anatomy, which leads to its own sort of uh, physiological aspects as well. Uh, to kind of give you the framework of the rest of the discussion, uh, things we're going to focus on. Um, when we talk about respiration, this can mean something a little bit different in 1306, in introductory cellular biology. So respiration, uh, we can talk about with the mitochondria, cellular respiration, right? The generation of ATP from a glucose molecule. Uh, we're going to not, not use that particular context. We're going to talk about respiration and respiration will involve both the respiratory system and the circulatory system. So again, there's that integration of, of our two systems. So within the, the framework of our discussion today, uh, we're going to look at the four processes that supply oxygen to the body and remove CO2 from the body. So this is going to be accomplished in four sort of four different stages, if you will. So the first being the pulmonary ventilation. Pulmonary ventilation is a very fancy way of saying breathing. That's the ventilation, moving air in and then moving air out. Right? Uh, that's an important process. There's a, the, from the laws of physics, it's a movement of this, this gas, the air, into the lungs and then out. Now, in, in that process, we're going to talk about external respiration. External respiration, transport, transport of the gases, and then internal respiration, which is actually at the cellular level, right? But, but different from um, cellular respiration, the generation of ATP. So respiration involves the pulmonary ventilation, uh, the breathing, movement of air in and out. External respiration is the exchange of oxygen and CO2 between the lungs and the blood. So there's a, that we're looking at it at, at moving into the body. So an external respiration, that's the first time oxygen would enter into the bloodstream. Uh, that's the last location where CO2 would remain in the bloodstream. CO2 now is given to the, uh, to the lungs. Uh, oxygen is taken from the lungs, right? And this, pulmonary ventilation and external respiration, these two stages will be solely the role of the respiratory system. So this is what the respiratory system does for you, right? It takes air from the outside environment and brings it into our lungs so that it can be pushed out into the bloodstream. After the respiratory system does its job, the rest depends on the circulatory system. So the actual transport, the loading of the the oxygen onto the hemoglobin, the transportation throughout the body based on the, the blood pressure, the cardiac output that is uh, sort of pumping blood throughout the body. And then the internal respiration, which is the reverse of external respiration. So internal respiration, now we're having the uh, sort of the, the leaving of uh, oxygen from the blood into the cells and the entering of waste, carbon dioxide, from the cells into the blood. So again, external respiration being the opposite of internal respiration. 
And again, the, the first two, pulmonary ventilation, external respiration, solely responsibility of the respiratory system, transport and internal respiration, solely the, uh, the responsibility of the circulatory system. Okay, so the anatomy. The anatomy is not too complex. I think you're gonna be familiar with a lot of these terms. I'm gonna go through these relatively rapidly. I will slow down once we get towards the alveoli. But uh, major organs, the nose, nasal cavity, paranasal sinuses, the pharynx, larynx, trachea, bronchi. From the bronchi we enter into the lungs and then we eventually dead end at the alveolar sacs, at the alveoli. So kind of all of the sort of the external and then the internal uh, components of the uh, respiratory anatomy. Um, kind of a just generic picture from, from most anatomy books. I'll show again the nose, nasal cavities, uh, mouth, the pharynx. The pharynx will be shared with the digestive system anatomy as well as the respiratory system anatomy. Then we're going to shift over into the larynx, the trachea, the bronchioles, and then the lungs. Right, so all of these components of the respiratory anatomy. Um, the book kind of describes two parts, the, the conducting zones and the respiratory zones. So conducting zone is just sort of the pipes. Think of your, your the air conditioning in your, in your home. Right? We have all of the ducts, the, the pipes that are gonna move the, the air from place to place, right? So that's the conducting zone. So conduits to gas exchange sites. So uh, all of the other respiratory structures, which are different from the respiratory zone, right? So. Uh, all of these muscles, the diaphragm, which we're going to talk about specifically, is going to help move air in and out through the conducting zone to get to the respiratory zone, which is where we're actually going to take, uh, or where we should, where I should say, that's where the gas exchange is, is going to actually take place. Here. It's at the microscopic level of the bronchioli here. All right, so the nose, I think most of you know what your nose is, right? It provides an airway, uh, moistens and warms the air, uh, filters. Uh, we have part of our uh, sort of the, the hairs, the innate uh, components of the nasal hairs. Uh, it's gonna help filter, clean out the you know, dust particles from the air. This guy is not having a good day there. So again, the nose, Paranasal sinuses, again, the nasal pharynx, oropharynx, laryngeal pharynx, they kind of subdivided into three parts. It's basically the pharynx, um, again, shared within the respiratory and can be shared with the digestive. If you've ever drank water or something and you just start laughing, you can see the, uh, that, that drink can actually kind of come out and very uncomfortably kind of squirt out the nostrils there. So that there's a link there. There's an open link. Uh, more detailed anatomy. Well, the larynx, the larynx, uh, we say provides a patent airway. Patent in physiological anatomical terms means open. So the larynx helps to keep the airway open. It's gonna route uh, air down to the lungs, down to the trachea, and it's gonna route then food away from the respiratory system into the digestive system. So it's a little, uh, a little valve. The epiglottis is gonna be a little valve that uh, basically helps you know, prevent uh, food going into the wrong direction. The larynx also is gonna be involved in voice production. So that's where we find our vocal folds, our vocal cords, um, as air comes up, it resonates against those generating sound. Uh, larynx, um, talking about some cartilages. So we have the uh, hyaline cartilages. Uh, I do want you to know the thyroid cartilage. Thyroid cartilage 
uh, with the laryngeal prominence. So you know this as the Adam's apple. So it's a very palpable type of anatomy. You can kind of feel, you can palpate that thyroid cartilage and know where the, the larynx, that, that laryngeal prominence would be. The larynx is going to be sort of ring-shaped. Um, we have these what we call cricoid cartilages. They're actually kind of uh, not completely round, but, but they're going to help to maintain patency. They're going to make that, uh, that airway stay open. Uh, I mentioned this epiglottis. The epiglottis is the little, uh, the little valve, if you will. It's going to shift uh, you know, back and forth depending on the situation. This elastic cartilage covers the laryngeal inlet during swallowing. So when we are eating, uh, the epiglottis covers the airway. So food goes into the stomach and not into the lungs. Occasionally, again, uh, we, you're drinking fluid or you're eating and, and things, uh, they say the drink goes down the wrong tube <laughs> and you start choking as, as the epiglottis didn't quite do what it was supposed to at that point. So again, the thyroid cartilage, you're looking at the sort of the frontal view here. So the thyroid cartilage, laryngeal prominence, the Adam's apple, and then all of our little cricoid cartilages and eventually our tracheal cartilages here, right? Um, there's the, to refer back to your skeletal anatomy, there's the hyoid bone, right? So that's sort of at the, superior edge of the larynx. Looking at a lateral view, right? Here's our Adam's apple. There's the thyroid cartilage. So here's our cricoid cartilages. And these, uh, this is gonna, we're gonna see little C-shaped rings as we go farther inferiorly. Vocal folds. So these are the vocal cords as air is moving upwards, resonating, kind of uh, shaking, vibrating those, uh, those vocal cords giving us our, our voice, the sound of our voice. Uh, I don't know if any of y'all are singers. Uh, if you have vibrato when you sing, that, that little resonance of, of the vocal cords giving that, that, that tone, that, that, uh, that, that, you know, I'm not a, a vocal coach at all, but, but, Again, that can be trained. You can train your, the sound production, the tone, the inflection, all of that stuff. Again, coming to the, uh, the anatomical basis of the vocal folds. All right, so the uh, larynx. Uh, larynx is gonna actually have another separate uh, important uh, characteristic. Uh, it's gonna, act as a sphincter. We've, we've talked about sphincters before as being circular muscles that can close, that can constrict around uh, small blood vessels, routing uh, blood in different directions. Uh, the larynx is going to play a role in basically holding, uh, trapping air in the thoracic area. Right? So uh, this action um, we're going to call, or one of the actions we're going to call Valsalva's maneuver. Uh, all of you are familiar with this. Maybe you don't know what it's called, uh, but let's say that we're going to lift something very heavy and you lift something heavy sort of uh, automatically that larynx holds. We, we kind of pressurize the thorax with, with air to stabilize the trunk. Yeah. Uh, let's say we're looking at um, uh, a little John. Little Johnny's uh, not eating enough fiber. Uh, they're having issues during the defecation process, right? Uh, so they go, they sit, and if you, you know, you hear like, mm, they're building internal pressure, building internal pressure. Valsalva's maneuver is holding pressure, allowing that force, and then hopefully that will help little Johnny uh, relieve his, you know, his, his uh, constipation, something like that. So uh, we increase intra-abdominal pressure, abdominal muscles contract, glottis closes to prevent the movement of air out, we use it as this internal support. So Valsalva's maneuver. Thank you, Larynx, for that uh, ability there, yeah? Uh, as we proceed in, uh, I should say, inferiorly down, so the larynx, we go into our trachea, and the trachea is our windpipe. 
right? It's just a conduit. It's part of this conducting zone, moving air down uh, towards the lungs. Uh, the trachea is lined with these C-shaped cartilages, right? They're hyaline cartilages. Uh, we have these C shapes. So again, to help maintain patency, to help maintain open. And if you wonder why, why is it not just completely round? Well, uh, posteriorly to the trachea, we have the esophagus. We're gonna cover that uh, pretty soon, part of the digestive system. But that's the, the food pipe, right? If the trachea is the windpipe, the esophagus is the food pipe, right? And that's gonna take food down into the, into the stomach. Well, if you eat a big bite or have a huge gulp or something, this will extend out, it will protrude out into the lumen of the trachea. So we don't want it completely enclosed. Uh, we can tolerate, you know, for short moments, protrusion bulging out into the lumen of the trachea. So in form fitting function, the position, the posterior position of the esophagus allowing then, uh, or necessit necess necessitating then the, uh, that space for expansion into the lumen of the trachea. So as we continue down the trachea, inferiorly into the trachea, we're gonna have a, a branch. And that branch then designates our bronchi. So the bronchi uh, is gonna be that first branch. And then from that left or right branch, then that branches again, and branches again, and branches again, and again, and again. Uh, and there's 22, or I should say 23 orders of branching. So not including the actual first bronchi, uh, there's uh, 23 orders of, of branching. So this generates what we call the respiratory tree. So it's just this network of little branches and this one branches and this one branches and this one branches until they get to the most tiny microscopic levels of, of branching. Um, so again, looking at the right tree, the left tree. And if you take a moment to notice, they're not completely symmetrical, right? They, 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 they're close, uh, but they don't exact, exactly exhibit the same symmetry. And again, any hypotheses why? Why we don't see symmetry in the left and right lungs, left and right bronchial trees? No, you remember? You remember the apex of the heart? The apex of the heart is not directly midline. The apex is uh, shifted more to the lateral left side over here. So that's uh, the reason we have to compensate for the physical space that the heart is taking up there. So, um, so we say the right main bronchus is wider, shorter, and more vertical than the left, right? And that's because again of the, the heart compensating uh, or the, the, the bronchi compensating for the, the position of the heart. A uh, little artist rendition here showing that notch in the left lung compensating for the apex in the position of the heart. Also, the lobes are going to be different. If you look at the right lung, we have three lobes of that lung. On the left side, we only have two. So again, similar, but not 100% uh, symmetrical. Uh, as we keep getting smaller, this, uh, you know, the 21st, the 22nd, and finally the 23rd, uh, sort of order of division, we get into these tiny, tiny, tiny bronchioles, uh, bronchioles then that we say are less than one millimeter in diameter. So that's, that's tiny, right? One millimeter in diameter, that's a really, really small little pipe that's not gonna really um, be able to allow a lot of air uh, very rapidly through that area. So again, little, little tubes. And again, the very terminal ones, they're even smaller, right? They're half a millimeter in, 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 in diameter. So that's, again, you're talking tiny, 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 tiny there. So up until this point, we've been in the conducting zone, moving air from the atmosphere uh, into this area. Now we shift to the respiratory zone. So respiratory zone will include the respiratory bronchioles. 
the alveolar ducts and the alveolar sacs, which are clusters of these alveoli. So again, we, if you notice in the picture, the bronchioles uh, arrive at these little pouches, these uh, uh, basically dead in the air sacs. And when we analyze, well, what is a lung? If I was to ask you, well, we know what lungs do, but what actually is a lung? Right? Well, a lung is this uh, elastic type of tissue, but it's comprised internally of over 300 million alveoli. So all of these little air sacs, which allow for this, uh, um, this expansion and, 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 and contraction. So over 300 million alveoli count for most of the lungs volume and are the main site for gas exchange. So this is where we now take the, the air that's been in the atmosphere down into the body. Now we get to move it into the blood at this point. So this is gonna be, but the site of our external respiration. So here we see our uh, arterial blood. So arterial blood is arriving, is arriving, is arriving, is arriving. And here we see our terminal bronchioli. So again, half a millimeter in diameter. Eventually, the air has nowhere to go. So the air gets sort of trapped here because of our pressure. We're going to move air out and as air as the oxygen now moves out it's going to be picked up by our uh, by our capillaries right so if we're tracing back our uh, pulmonary circuit so we say in pulmonary circuit our arteries are in blue so here's our uh, our pulmonary circuit arteries coming to the lungs arteries now picking up oxygen and if you notice now we're shifting from the blue coloration. Finally, once we pick up oxygen, we go back towards the left uh, atrium of the heart and we're going back with oxygenated blood. So the oxygenation of the blood happens at the capillaries that surround the alveoli. So all of this then being the, uh, the site of external respiration. And again, you can see all the elastic fibers so we, when they're filled, they expand, but the elastic fibers then help them recoil back. Right? So all of this is an important uh, physical, um, sort of the, the, from the realm of physics, a, a physical ability to do their job effectively, to expand and recoil, to allow for pressurization, to allow for that pressure to move air from alveoli out into the capillaries. So again, we're arriving from the pulmonary circulation. We're arriving uh, blue, deoxygenated, we pick up oxygen, and then we send red oxygenated blood back towards the heart. External respiration. Um, I'm not gonna spend too much time here. Just again, think logically. If, if we're gonna be diffusing oxygen through a membrane, that membrane is gonna have to be very thin. Right, so that those alveolar walls have to be very thin in order to allow for this to happen. So we're talking micrometer uh, thickness there. Uh, surfactant, surfactant, uh, surfactant is a chemical that basically reduces the surface tension of water. So if you can imagine these little airways, if they, if these little airways ever actually touch if they if, if air goes out and these little balloons these little air sacs touch there is some humidity there's some moisture in there and because of uh 1306 concepts or chemical concepts from you know of water water characteristics water forms of the hydrogen bonds with other water and it makes it quite, quite sticky so it will shift and slide relatively easy but it will be hard to open up that air sac again so um, in order to prevent that, we have the production of surfactant. Surfactant then basically is uh, diminishing uh, water's ability to adhere with other water molecules. So if they do happen to touch, that's okay. Surfactant is there and they're not going to seal and stick together. They can open up easily during the next uh, inhalation. 
So surfactants, the detergent like lipid and protein complex, uh, it, it, it really is not going to be a, an issue as an adult for you all. Uh, when we see it being a major issue is if a baby is born too prematurely, they don't have enough surfactant in their lungs, uh, they can have a very, very difficult time breathing, right? very forceful to the inhalation must be strong enough to tear apart that uh, cohesion of water uh, each breath, right? So we give them, we, we enable them to speed up the production of surfactant or we give them pressurized oxygen uh, to help them breathe. All right, so inside of the alveoli there. Uh, now we get to the lungs. Uh, so the lungs are, again, these uh, elastic tissue just with all of these 300 million alveolar sacs that are comprising them. So at the, uh, the surface, the base, will be resting on the diaphragm, which we're going to talk about very shortly. Uh, the hilum, this is where uh, the bronchi enter, or bronchi enter into the lungs, and the cardiac notch uh, is the left side that accommodates for the heart. Now we've kind of talked a little bit about distinctions in the lungs. There's a sort of a, a top view here. So there's the pericardial sac that separates the heart. And then we see the pleural cavities, the pleural sacs in which the, the lungs are founded. Same concept. So the lungs are expanding and recoiling. Expanding and recoiling, they're going to generate friction. They're going to generate heat. So the same uh, aspects that the heart generated the lungs generate as well. So to compensate for that, we have a very similar solution. We had the pericardial sac around the heart. We're gonna have the pleural sac around the lungs. Right? Same, same idea, we fill it with fluid to help lubricate, to help minimize friction, to help reduce heat generation. Uh, again, a similar problem and a similar solution that the body has devised. So there's our pleural, pleural cavity, pleury, um, again, I'm not going to spend too much time on this anatomy. Just again, lubrication, reducing surface tension. Uh, I will address this when we get to pressures a little bit later, though. All right, so going back to that initial slide, we said that breathing involves pulmonary ventilation. Right? We've got to move air in and out. And we or I should say non-anatomy uh, non people would say inhalation, exhalation. Breathing in, breathing out. Inhale, exhale. Well, anatomists uh, use a different term, inspiration and expiration. Uh, I don't like those terms, but that's what they use. Um, uh, inspiration, the moving of gas into the lungs. Expiration, the movement of air out of the lungs. Yep. Uh, before I continue on with the anatomy and this kind of stuff, we've got to talk a little bit about sort of uh, physics, uh, atmospheric composition, that kind of stuff. Um, air pressure. So if you know something about air pressure, air, think of air as a, it's a fluid, right? It's, it's a gas. But if we're looking at the underwater realm, right? So the underwater idea if a if a diver goes very deep underwater we can say well can we envision a a column of water above that that diver so there's a little diver right here we'll say i don't know why it keeps popping up there's a little diver right here a little divers there and we can envision a column of gas i should say a column of water above that diver and water is heavy. Water is, is squashing down, compressing from the top, compressing from the sides on that diver. And that's what we call water pressure. So the, the deeper the diver goes into the ocean, the greater the pressure. Well, if we can think of air as a similar uh, ocean, it's an ocean of, of gas rather than, than an ocean of water. So the deeper that we go, 
in this ocean of gas, the more uh, air particles are compressing on the individual. So the closer we are to sea level, we say that's where we're gonna experience the greatest amount of air pressure. If I start climbing up a high mountain, if I'm here on top of Mount Everest, there's not as much air compressing down upon me as if I was at sea level. Right? More air, a greater column of air compressing down on me. So the higher we go up in elevation, the less air pressure is being exerted on the body. And, and that's going to be important. So uh, where would it be easier to breathe? It would be easier where there's greater pressure. There's greater pressure squashing down on you, making that air more easily forced into your lungs. If we're up on Mount Everest, uh, not a lot of air uh, being compressed on you, so making it difficult to move that air from atmosphere into the body. So we normally measure air pressure as a barometric pressure, right? Millimeters of mercury is a very common way of, of, of uh, recording that. We can also do it in bars, um, uh, different units, but it's the same idea. So air pressure would be greatest at sea level. And as we go up in elevation, air pressure drops, gets less, right? There's less air pressure up high more air pressure down towards sea level. Okay, ah, this next bit, let me again, kind of slow down a little bit here. Uh, when we look at pressure, pressure was the driving force in the circulatory system. Blood always moved from high pressure areas to low pressure areas. It's gonna be the same idea in the respiratory system. Air. Um, any of the individual gases are going to always move down their uh, pressure gradients. They're going to go from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. So uh, when we're looking at the movement of, of air, we're going to start to have a, a basis for comparison. That is our atmospheric pressure. So atmospheric pressure, pressure atmospheric, right? ATM, atmospheric pressure. Uh, an average, a standard that is used uh, is going to be uh, what we say 760 millimeters of mercury at sea level, right? 760 millimeters of mercury at sea level. So uh, if we're looking at uh, this idea, so this one is not the same. Um, it's measuring Mount Everest up there, right? But if we are at, at sea level, a generic average of uh, air pressure at sea level, 760 millimeters of mercury. So that's the pressure exerted by the air surrounding the body. Again, that's gonna, it's gonna fluctuate. It's gonna change whether the, uh, the day is nice and sunny or if there's a, a, you know, a, a thunderstorm in the area. It just, the more gas that's in that area, the more uh, pressure will be exerted. So uh, again, just, just an average, and it's very rarely actually 760, but we're going to use that as that uh, relative uh, comparative uh, average. So when we talk about respiratory pressures, respiratory pressures are described relative to atmospheric pressure, relative to 760 millimeters of mercury. So negative pressures would be a pressure less than 760, positive pressure, uh, pressure greater than 760. And if it's a zero pressure, that means we're at 760. So all of these pressures I'm gonna talk about in the next few slides will uh, be linked back to uh, that 760 as that relative standard. So, if we're looking inside of the lungs, right? If, if we're on sea level, um, obviously it's a little bit different here in El Paso, it's, we're not at sea level, so it's, uh, it's normally on average uh, less than 760. But if we're looking at, just, just for theoretical purposes here, atmospheric pressure being at 760, so you breathe in atmospheric pressure gas. So what do we find 
inside of the lungs? Well, surprise, surprise, we find the same thing, 760. So uh, we're going to say inside of the lungs, intrapulmonary, inside of the lungs, uh, we find pressure at 760. So we would report that as zero, right? Relative to atmospheric, it's the same. There's no difference between atmospheric pressure and uh, intrapulmonary pressure. If we're looking then at the intrapleural pressure, this is the pressure in that little pouch, that little bag that surrounds the lungs that's minimizing friction, minimizing heat, uh, lubricating. Uh, that pressure will always be negative. It will always be four, millimeter, four millimeters uh, negative relative to intrapulmonary pressure. And it has to be, and I'll explain why very shortly. So. Uh, we have again negative four in the space, in the pouch, in the intrapleural space. We have 760, so zero in the intrapulmonary space. So a lot of vocabulary here to look at, right? So atmospheric pressure, we're looking at then the uh, pressure of the um, intrapulmonary space, intrapleural space. And again, intrapulmonary pressure, also known as intraalveolar pressure, will always equalize with the atmospheric pressure. So whatever atmospheric pressure is outside, uh, it will equalize with your intrapulmonary pressure. And it always fluctuates with breathing. Right? Pressure inside of the alveoli. Intrapleural pressure will always be negative. It will always be negative four. And it has to be uh, so we can stay uh, within the realms of normal lung physiology. And I'll explain that again shortly here. So if for whatever reason there is a leak in pressure between the intrapleural space and the intrapulmonary space, uh, that will cause then intrapleural pressure to equalize with intrapulmonary pressure. And if that happens, uh, basically, um, you're going to then detach the lung from its, from its wall, from the thoracic wall, right? And, and, and that's not good, right? You, you have in that situation a, uh, a collapsed lung, right? Atelectasis, uh, pneumothorax. You, you have uh, basically, the lung that, that detaches and is no longer functioning in gas exchange. So, uh, the negative intrapleural pressure uh, will help to um, oppose lung collapse. So, if these two pressures equalize, then you will have lung collapse. Not, not a good thing. So, if intrapleural pressure and intrapulmonary pressure equalize, the lungs collapse. So we have to have that negative four uh, difference, uh, negative four millimeters of mercury difference in pressure between intrapulmonary and intrapleural space. So again, here we see the lung that's fully inflated. Here we see a lung that, well, we have all this empty space. So the wall of the lung detached from the thorax and that lung is not being able then to recoil and, and, and be involved in functional gas exchange. So um, atelectasis, also known as a collapsed lung. Uh, pneumothorax is when we have air in the thoracic space. We, we want air inside the lungs, but we don't want air in between the lungs and the thoracic wall. So it's uh, air in the wrong spot there. Um, yeah, so it's a better picture of a collapsed lung. All this space, that pneumothorax, is not going to be involved in, in, in good ga gas exchange. So how do we fix it? Well, we, we have to reestablish that negative pressure. So basically, uh, you can imagine a little vacuum kind of drawing negative pressure. And with negative pressure, the lung then kind of is able to reflex, bulge out, reestablish its connection with the thoracic wall, and we have that negative four millimeters of mercury there. 
just amazing what four uh, little units of, of, of different pressure will cause in the lungs, right? So everything in the lungs is based on pressure and pressure gradients. So again, we have to have 760 and we have to have negative four here. So we're at zero and negative four for normal lung physiology. So again, uh, inspiration versus expiration. Um, we're gonna go back to a, a law. Maybe you have uh, learned in, in, in chemistry class, uh, Boyle's uh, ideal gas law. I don't know if you learned it or not. Um, I learned it in chemistry class. I didn't really know what it meant in chemistry class. I didn't really make sense of that law until we brought it into physiology. Okay, well, that makes sense now, right? And that ideal gas law really has an implication in volume changes and pressure changes. So an inverse relationship between volume and pressure. And we know that air will always go from higher pressure areas to lower pressure. So we can move air uh, wherever we want. All we have to do is have an effect on the volume. We change the volume, which means we change the pressure, which means we can control where we want air to go. And again, all this is, falls within the realm of physics and chemistry, but it has vital importance in the realm of physiology. So how are we gonna accomplish uh, volume changes? Well, pretty simple. We're gonna use this uh, dome-shaped muscle right, that we call the diaphragm. Right? The diaphragm is this big dome-shaped muscle that will accomplish volume changes. Uh, here's that law, right? Uh, pressure varies inversely with volume, right? P1, V1 equals P2, V2. And, and the relationship between pressure and volume of a gas, we call Boyle's ideal gas law, right? The, the, the idea is that I can have a glass half filled with, um, with liquid, a quarter filled with liquid, three quarters filled with liquid, but I can have a, uh, a, a, a cup or this area half filled with gas or a quarter filled with gas. Gas will always take up the entire space that it can, right? And, and uh, it's gonna do that. It's gonna change its volume at the expense of also inversely changing its pressure. Right? So Boyle's Law. So when we're talking about inspiration, moving air into the lungs, right? This is an active process. So inspiratory muscles contract. So we have to have a contraction of the muscle. Uh, thoracic volume increases. Lungs are stretched and intrapulmonary uh, volume increases. Intrapulmonary pressure drops to negative one. Air flows into the lungs down its pressure gradient until pulmonary Pressure is equivalent to atmospheric pressure. Whew, lots of words there, right? So let's uh, pause for a moment. Uh, a lot of things are happening during inhalation or what we call inspiration. Right? You don't think about this. You just do it. It's not that big of a deal to you. Uh, but a lot of things are happening physiologically for us to move air from out around us into our lungs. Right? It's an active process. It requires then the, uh, the muscular contraction for this to happen. So in picture format. So inhalation over here. Inhalation, the contraction that happens, the, the diaphragm starts to move downwards, right? So there's a, a downwards contraction on the diaphragm. So as the diaphragm is moving downwards, it's making the thoracic cavity larger, right? We're, we're giving the thoracic uh, area more space. So vol volume starts to increase. And as volume increase, what do we know about pressure? Pressure decreases, right? So pressure decreases to about negative one. So as pressure decreases, air goes from a higher pressure area to a lower pressure area. 
So as the diaphragm is moving downwards, air is moving downwards as well into the lungs. And that's what we call inspiration, right? So the inspiratory muscles contract, the intracostal muscles also help to flex open the rib cage. Lungs are stretched, intrapulmonary volume increases. We have more space, which means less pressure, which, move, which means more air can move from the atmospheric 760 into our negative pressure internally. Right? And this will happen for a while until those pressures equalize. Again, we're gonna change about negative one intrapulmonary for, for, a, for a brief moment until we then equalize um, with the uh, atmospheric pressure. Yeah, so again, all these things are happening to allow for the inspiratory process. Now, expiration, the opposite. So now this is a passive process. So that diaphragm is like a, like a recoil, right? So it worked hard to contract. Now when we relax, it kind of flexes back up, right? So that, that moving upwards. So now we compress on the lungs. We make the volume smaller. So as volume decreases, pressure increases. And as pressure increases, we're going to have higher pressure, higher pressure, higher pressure. So then we're able then to move air out. And that's the expiration process, right? This is a quiet expiration. It's normally a passive process. Inspiratory muscles relax. Thoracic cavity volume decreases, which means intrapulmonary pressure will increase. So we go to a positive one. Air flows out of the lungs, down is pressure gradient until... Uh, Pulmonary, intrapulmonary pressure is equivalent to zero. Now this is just quiet, passive expiration. Forced expiration is a little bit different, right? So if you're gonna, uh, you have your birthday cake in front of you, you're gonna have to really work hard to move a lot of air out, to blow all the candles out. That's not what we call just quiet expiration, just a normal breathing. That's an actual, <sighs> Really, really, we're forcing, we're, 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 we're contracting, you know, extra hard around the lungs to make the volume even smaller to move air uh, out, right? So to, to increase the pressure so that we can move down that pressure gradient out. So again, breathing is a factor of volume changes and the corresponding pressure changes. And we know now that all of the volume change initiates from the diaphragm's position. So the diaphragm in inspiration, moving outwards, expanding volume, decreasing uh, pressure. Expiration, diaphragm recoils upwards, uh, making volume less, increasing intrapulmonary pressure higher, which is going to force air out. So simple physics. Thank you, physics, for allowing us the ability to move air in and out for allowing us to breathe basically um yeah, so just different pressures we go from a zero we have our negative four this stays consistent at negative four so we don't have collapsed lung right, so we fluctuate to a negative one in inspiration and then a positive one in expiration it just kind of fluctuates like that with every breath cycle All right, so with that, uh, I think we're um, in a good stopping point. So uh, we're gonna get into some other ideas, but um, this is a good stopping point so the video doesn't get super long. And basically, so we can start to make sense of this first stuff. And then we're gonna kind of add some other gas laws and we're gonna look at maybe some, uh, you know, homeostatic imbalances that can happen with normal uh, respiration as well. So again, with that, let me take a little break here. And I hope this is making sense. So uh, keep an eye out for the next uh, respiratory video that will accompany this one here. Right? All right, so you'll have a good one for now.